All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. So I am Nate Taylor. Uh, I do work, I'm a software developer out of Omaha, Nebraska, a company called Avature. Um, like I was telling some of the folks, if you were in early, I, I'm not from Louisville, uh, but I spent from 2004 to 2007 in town, so it's good to, it's good to be back. Um, it was an enjoyable uh, trip around uh, Crescent Hill yesterday and then out this way. Uh, we actually lived um, at Hurstbourne and um, Breckenridge, so we're like two miles from here. So when the map came out, I was like, oh, I know where that's at. That's the Walmart we used to shop at. Um, so it's good to be back. Uh, we're going to talk today about everything I need to know about debugging. I learned in elementary physics. Uh, and, and we're going to start with a little bit of a background, a little bit of, of my, my history here of, of how this talk came about. So in 2000, I graduated from the University of Missouri Rollo with a BS in EE. Uh, and one of the required classes in all the engineering programs at Rolla is uh, Physics 23. It's the first semester of physics. Um, and it is a weed out course. So there's a few weed out courses at, at all engineering colleges and Rolla is no different. Um, one was Math 8, which was first semester calculus. One was Physics 23, uh, which was Newtonian physics. And then one was Physics 24, which was the following semester. Um, in, or in order to continue on in your career, you had to get a C or better. Uh, and if you didn't get a C, you didn't necessarily flunk out of school, but you had to take the class again. And so there was some pressure on me because here it is like second semester or maybe it's first semester, second year, somewhere around then that like if I don't get this C, I'm going to be behind already, right? I want to move on. I can't take my engineering classes that I'm really excited about until I pass this. Um, not to mention that I was very fortunate. Uh, my, my dad, from before I was born, started saving for my college, so he was paying for it. So I felt an extreme pressure of like, I can't ask my dad to pay for another class if I don't pass this one, right? Like there's this kind of this pressure on myself. Uh, and so before I ever stepped in fo in, uh, step foot into the lecture hall of Physics 23 uh, that first day, I'd already started applying some, um, some pressure to myself that this was going to be something I, I needed to do well in. And I'd had physics in high school, um, but for all intents and purposes, I might as well not have. Uh, I think the only thing I remember after a year of high school physics was F equals MA. Uh, and we, we moved way past that after about the second week of college physics. So uh, it was not, I was not at all prepared, uh, just full of anxiety about it. Not to mention that the professor that had that taught physics at Rolla and still does to my to this day is my understanding, uh, or the one that taught it for engineers. Physics 23 was for only for engineers, not physics majors. Um, he doesn't like engineers. He likes physics He likes physics students, um, and at least that's his public persona. That's how he runs the class. He doesn't like you. He doesn't want to make your life easy. Uh, but he he did like movies, and so he liked to show video clips all the time in class. And so the first day of class, he shows this and he. He pauses it at this scene and he says, okay, what's wrong? And you have about 100 or 200 students, freshmen, nervously sitting there, not wanting to speak up in this big lecture hall, not even knowing what he's really asking. And so he talks about the physics of sand versus gold and all this kind of stuff. And you start to breathe a sigh of relief like, oh, okay, yeah, that kind of makes sense that this probably physically wasn't really, I mean, it's Hollywood, right? It's Hollywood physics. It's cartoon physics. Okay, this class isn't going to be that bad. Well, then he starts talking about tests, and we were going to have um, three tests and a final. And he said, this is your test. Uh, you have the boulder chasing you out of the temple here. And, and you're going to be working through this test in a big uh, lecture hall for an hour, hour and a half, whatever the test time was. And, and you're going to be nervously trying to solve these physics equations, and you're, you're hoping that you're getting it right, and you're sweating, and, and you're just nervous the whole time, right? And, and, and as you get to the last question and you, you solve it, uh, whether the answer is right or not, you, you're at that point don't even care because the test is done and you can take it up front and you can hand it in. And he said, and you, you, can, you can walk out of the room and you can breathe this big sigh of relief. You can go back to your dorm and, and just relax until you realize that these are your graders. And, and this is exactly, I mean, these aren't word for word, but this is the, the attitude that he was trying to do. So here we are in the first five or 10 minutes of Physics 23, and, and you're just looking around like, you know, is this candid camera? Am I being punked? What's going on here? Because this guy seems like he's got it out for me. Uh, and, and I was anything but a confident 18 or 19 year old, especially in my, in my physics skills. Um, that was not something that I would have I staked any reputation on. In fact, uh, at the end, he was, so he was, uh, he was very anal um, about how he graded. And um, at the end of the semester, I said, I think, I think my grade's wrong before I took the final. And he was so sure, he said, well, do you want to bet your grade on it? And I was like, nope, never mind, you're right, it's fine. Uh, because I was not about to take that, that risk. Uh, so confidence was far, uh, far away from me during physics. So to say at this point, I mean, we're 10 minutes into this class, to say that at this point I'm a bundle of nerves is a bit of an understatement. I put the pressure on myself that to, to at least get a C so I can continue on in my career. I've seen uh, kind of how his attitude is 
towards engineers. I've seen how he approaches physics. Um, one interesting thing, uh, just to kind of underscore the anxiety that he liked to induce, uh, he, he typo, he, there was a typo in one of his slides. And he had this big, like the full width of this room, lab bench in the front. And he sees it uh, on the PowerPoint. He's like, ah, oh, and he kind of mumbles under his breath. And he, and he goes and he puts his hand on the lab bench and he pulls out his meter stick and smacks his own hand. And I was like, oh my gosh, this guy's serious. And, um, whoa, this is going to be a fun talk if that keeps happening. Um, I guess I won't move around as much. That lasted, though, until I was uh, one of the last people out of the room um, and saw that he then went and deliberately typoed the slide for the next section so that he could repeat the same shtick. Um, so I was still intimidated, but I realized that th this is him. This is He wants us to be intimidated. So I was a bundle of nerves, uh, not necessarily because of what Dr. Beenick was doing, but at least because of how the pressure I'd put on. But there's more than just those nerves going on at this point. Um, I don't know how many of you have had this experience, but growing up, I always was told, you won't get away with that in blank. So in fifth grade, you would miss an assignment, and they would say, oh, you won't get away with that in middle school. They won't let that fly. Uh, and then I got to middle school, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, and they're like, okay, we'll let you turn in the assignment a day late, but come high school, that's not going to happen. And uh, interestingly enough, in high school, uh, I sat next to my best friend in, um, in English 101, or it was a composition, so it was a senior year, and we had, to, we had to do a rough draft, and we had to bring it in for grading that day. And my best friend, Matt, holds up a floppy drive, which for you younger people is how we used to store documents. Um, and he says, Mrs. Wagner, uh, I couldn't get my printer to connect to my computer last night. I have my paper on here, but I'm using Microsoft Word, and the library only has Microsoft Works, which for you young people was a really horrible uh, Word text document uh, thing. And she said, well, go get Nelson. He was the, like the whiz at our school. And he's like panicking because Matt doesn't have anything on his floppy disk. And he knows that he doesn't have any, but he's like, Mrs. Wagner doesn't know that, right? So he goes and finds out to his luck that Nelson is out sick that day. And so he comes back and he says, oh, he's out sick. You know, the librarian tried to help me. She says, okay, we'll just bring it in tomorrow, right? So here we have this supposedly college level high school class on writing saying, oh yeah, just bring it in tomorrow. But don't, don't you know, they're not gonna let you get away with that in college, right? And that was the next step. And I heard this in college then, they're not gonna let you get away with that in the real world, but we all write software so we know that deadlines are imaginary and estimates are made up. And so the people in college were wrong as well. All except for Dr. Beatner, or Beatnik. Um, he wouldn't let you get away with it in college. So we have this massive lecture hall full of physics students. Uh, there was a pop quiz one time in which uh, he told us at the beginning of the semester, uh, the way I do pop quizzes, you, you, when I say turn them in, you pass them to the end of the aisle. And if when I walk past your row, their tests are not there, that row fails, that quiz fails. And sure enough, he goes up one side and down the other, and on this side, they weren't done. And so he stood there and waited, and he had everyone else's tests in this hand. He grabbed this row in this hand. He walks to the end of the room and he throws them away, right in front of everyone. And to this gentleman's credit, one of the students stood up and said, I was the one that held up the whole line. And so he went, found his paper, left it in the trash, and took the rest out. But he was not joking around. I'm not, you know, if that kid doesn't stand up and say that was me, we're, that whole row is flunking their test. So again, there's a lot of anxiety going on. But even all of that is still not the most anxiety riddled part of physics for me. Um, one of the most riddled things, or most anxiety-inducing parts, was we had our lectures on Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, or I'm sorry, Mondays and Wednesdays. And these would be 100, 200 people in the lecture. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we'd go to a smaller room, maybe about this size, and there'd be 20 of us at a time, and we would, we'd go over the homework, um, which sounds nice. But the way, doc, the way this professor did it was, throughout the year, randomly, you were selected to do your problem at the board. There'd be four or five of us. So this whole room would be nothing but chalkboards on all the walls. And you would be assigned to do a problem during the class, in front of everyone, without your notes, just the textbook and the problem number. And it was, it was homework you did the night before, so it wasn't the first time you saw it. But if you can imagine being in front of a room full of people and trying to remember what was the third thing you did last night when you did your homework, it, it just, it's gone, right? So it looked like this. I mean, it looked like a room like this. It's a room full of desks uh, um, and, and just, you know, 18, 19, maybe 20-year-old college freshmen, maybe college sophomores in this class, all with the same anxiety that you have, but you don't realize that they have the anxiety until you're my age. Uh, you know, at 40, looking back, you go, oh, everyone had that anxiety. It wasn't just me. Um, this is what it looked like. This is what it felt like. It felt like you were the one person in front of this giant auditorium solving a physics problem. And I don't know if you guys know this about engineers, but we're kind of judgmental and a little arrogant. And so you felt like everyone was up there judging not only whether you were doing the problem right, but they were probably judging your penmanship or whatever it is they could find to judge. Uh, and so it was very anxiety-inducing. And this was all for a grade. So this was all 
part of your grade in physics. So it wasn't just like, hey, we're going to make this guy sweat, sweat and squirm, but his grade's going to depend on it. So I am a huge bundle of nerves at this point. But thankfully, all of that anxiety, um, one thing, and it's not the only thing, but one of the things that this professor did was he, he developed four steps for when you're solving physics problems. So when you come to the board and you get, your, uh, you get called and you have to bring your physics book up and your chalk or you grab some chalk or uh, whatever, if you did these four steps, you got partial credit, almost 50%, almost which is awesome because like, hey, at least I'm going to get 40%, right? Um, and the reason why was if you do these steps, he was pretty sure that that would guide you to the right direction. And if you messed up and got the wrong answer, it was probably a simple mathematical error, not, not something major. You know, you, you, you probably weren't going to be off by a factor of 10 or something like that. So the four steps is you get the physics problem. You have to have a labeled diagram. You, you have a diagram that shows the, the vectors and the quantities and all this kind of stuff. You have to write out what's known. What do you know? What's the physics problem telling you, that you, you the, the information that it's giving you to start with? And then the opposite of that, what's unknown? What are you trying to solve for and what do you need to find to be able to solve that? And then finally, write out a starting equation. Um, and this is particularly helpful in physics and we'll see how this plays out with software as well in a little bit. So we're going to actually walk through this just to kind of get a, an example of how this might work. Um, but bef um, yeah, I got ahead of myself here. So the steps there, these steps as an as a anxiety-riddled 18, 19-year-old freshman help me go from, okay, this is impossible for me to stand in front of this class and, and write out this physics problem to something that could at least be achievable. Um, if for nothing else, like I could kill time by drawing a diagram and writing out some equations, and then maybe the, perf the, the TA would just be like, okay, just go have a seat, right? Like you've, done, you've been up here for 20 minutes and all you've got is like two equations and a picture. Um, but at least I could kill time and, and get some partial credit. So here's the first problem. An airplane accelerates down a runway at 3.2 meters per second squared for 32.8 seconds until it finally lifts off the ground. Determine the distance traveled before takeoff. Uh, there's going to be two physics problems in this and then some bugs as well, software stuff. Um, all the physics problems come from a physics classroom. They're sim simple, I use in quotes, kinematic equations. Um, they really are elementary physics, Newtonian F equals MA type stuff. Um, so here's the picture. It looks like a photograph, but it's actually hand drawn by me. Um, <laughs> We've got a plane moving down a runway at 3.2 meters per second squared, and we don't know what the distance is. Um, so what do, we, what do we know about the problem? Well, to, know, to find out what we know, we need to go back to the problem. We see that the airplane's accelerating at 3.2 meters per second squared. Uh, so we'll, we'll mark that down. We'll say, okay, acceleration is 3.2 meters per second squared. And we know that it does this for 32.8 seconds. So we, we know acceleration and we know time. This is, what, this is what's known in this physics problem. So we've done two things. We've labeled our diagram and we've written out what's known. So what's unknown? Well, for physics problems, homework problems, textbook problems, it's really easy. You go to the problem and they say, determine the distance. Oh, that's what's not known. Distance. Okay. So distance isn't known. That's what we have to solve for. So then we have to come up with a starting equation. And, and in this particular physics class, it was made a little bit easier because there was a list of approved starting equations um, so that you would not spend all of your time coming up with some random equation that didn't even make sense. So there were four kinematic, there are four kinematic uh, equations for distance, velocity, acceleration, and time. This is the one that we're going to use here. It's simply distance equals the initial velocity times time plus half of the acceleration times time squared. Uh, we'll plug that in, plug in the values that we have from our problem, uh, put them in, solve, and we find that the distance is 1077.44 meters. So just like that, you've solved a physics problem at 10.30 in the morning. Um, and some of you, it's been at least 20 years, like me, since you've been in physics. Some of them, some of you maybe was last week, you took a physics final. Um, but you've, everyone has now solved a physics problem, which probably seemed a lot scarier than it was, because we have these four steps. And those four steps, again, we had our labeled diagram, we had what's known, we had what's unknown, and we had our starting equation. So all of that's kind of the setup, right? Not, this isn't a physics conference, and if it was, this would be the world's worst physics talks, because who's going to come to a physics talk to learn about kinematic equations at a conference, right? So we're talking about software. So let's just get on to software, right? How can we apply these four rules to software? I talked about the anxiety uh, that I faced uh, in physics. And I have to wonder, does anyone experience that when bugs come up uh, in your planning meeting or in the stand-up? And, and someone says, hey, we have this bug. Um, I don't know if you've ever looked around the room at that point, but like 90% of the people just, oh, something interesting happened on their smartphone, right, when the bug was announced, right? Uh, something, some email really must be important because they're not making eye contact with whoever's talking about the bug because, because we have this anxiety of like, what if I don't know how to fix that, right? Uh, with a few exceptions, right? Like there's a typo on the button, then everyone's like, oh, I've got it, I've got it, I can take that one, right? Um, but if it's anything more than that, then we kind of are like, uh, 
maybe this guy will take it because I think he's smarter than me. So uh, there's some definite anxiety when it comes to bugs. It's a little bit easier when you're dealing with features, at least in my experience, because, because that's undefined. It's new uncharted territory. And oftentimes there's no like right answer on the feature, right? Like we want to contact this person. You're like, great, let's go contact them. You know, I'll write the feature to do it. But when it's a bug, there's very often like clear, like this is what it's supposed to do. And it's doing the opposite of that. And you're like, oh, I don't know how to make that work. So you might encounter this in your TPS reports or your better called standups, um, at least if you're like me and you have uh, daily standups um, that sometimes drag on and on and on where you talk about the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and, and what happens is you come in and you say, oh, I've got, uh, Nate, what are you doing today? And, okay, well, I'm working on Jira ticket 13579 uh, and it's about this pop-up menu and the text isn't there, but it should be and it is on other screens, um, but not this one. And I'm gonna look at that one today. And everyone's like, oh, okay, great. Yeah, that's important. Let's, let's solve that, right? And so then the next day you come in and they're like, what'd you do yesterday? Well, I looked at 13579. Okay, what are you doing today? I'm looking at 13579. <laughs> I still don't know why the text isn't showing up. It's still showing up on other screens. It's still not showing up on my screen, right? <laughs> and if you continue this for a couple days, then you start to hear negative voices. Some of them, sometimes, if you're fortunate, they're internal negative voices. And if you work on a bad team, they're external negative voices, where people might say, are you still working on that? Right, like that's the bug that you're still working, you're working on that for two days. You're working on a menu that the text isn't showing up, um, which actually is a bug I did last week for like three days. Um, other ones you might hear someone say, or you might say, what, what's taking so long, right? Like that shouldn't be that big of a deal, right? It's not that big of a problem. Uh, you could get in and solve it in five minutes. I don't know what's taking so long. You must be playing darts or foosball or surfing Reddit. You must not really be working, right? Um, or you might hear someone say, isn't that just blank? And then they just totally trivialize everything you just did, right? Like, oh, isn't it just this blah, 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 blah? And you're like, I don't know, right? Like maybe. Or you say, no, it's not. Like clearly it's not just a typo. I would have found the typo by now if it was just a typo, right? And you kind of like, you start getting your, your, your uh, defenses up because you're like, no, it's not that simple. Like I'm not wasting three days of the team's time because it's that simple, right? Uh, and so you have this anxiety where uh, everyone on the team is smarter than you and everyone on the team is judging you. And you're like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I can't figure out this bug, right? So that's where these four steps are gonna come in. Um, maybe it's just me, but I heard, I heard some laughter. I saw some people nodding. I saw some like knowing glances and elbows, you know? So uh, I think other people experience some of that same stuff. Much like the four steps help me move from an impossible physics problem to an achievable one, the four steps help me move from an impossible bug to one that I know that I can achieve, right? Even if I don't know how to, what the final solution is, even if I can't get the bug to work, I can at least go through these steps and I can make a lot of progress so that when I go ask for help, I'm not just going, oh, it still doesn't work and I don't know why, right? So we're gonna look at that. Uh, here's the first, first software bug that we're gonna see. We are displaying a registration form and instead of showing quote first name for the label, it shows registration dot first name. So step one, draw a picture with software. If, especially if it's dealing with the UI, you don't have to draw the picture because there's a UI for you. You can go screenshot it, right? And if, if the person reporting the bug um, is doing a great job, then this picture will already be in the bug and step one will already be done for you. Uh, but we can see here's our registration form and sure enough, it says registration dot first name, last name, email, password, password com, confirm and register. Uh, and that doesn't look like what the designers wanted it to look like, and so they're, they're probably right. Yeah, this seems like a bug. Um, so what do we know? Well, we know that it should show first name, because they said it should show first name. Uh, but we, know that it's, we also know that it's using a localized string. Now, none of you knew that until I just said that, because you're not working on the imaginary system that I made up for this bug, but I was, right? But you can imagine that, that we were all working on this as a team, and so we knew the system to some degree, right? And so it, it, we know more than what the person in the bug report is telling us, because we've been on our system. Unless, unless maybe it's your first day, in which case you'd say, hey, could I have an easier bug, because I don't, I don't know what this is, right? Give me, give me the typos, I'll take those. Um, and we also know that it, what it is showing. So it's, it's showing the translation key, and we only know that because we know we're using localized strings. Um, so we have some kind of translation service uh, because our app is gonna be in Russian and German and French and English and all these other languages. So what's not known though? We don't know, I mean, there's a million things we don't know, almost infinite number of things we don't know about this bug. But one of the things that we don't know is, is the value specified in the translation layer? Maybe, right? Maybe that's, maybe that's the thing that we should check first. So that kind of translates then not into a starting equation, but a starting location with software. Software, especially as you have bigger and bigger 
pieces of software, there's more and more balls of mud to climb through. And so sometimes it's just as simple as like, what's the best puddle of mud to jump into on this application? So we know we've got translations and we know that it's showing the translation key. So why don't we start with the translations file? Well, it might look something like this. Um, and so here we have uh, our login information at the top and we have some status strings at the bottom and then we have our registration right here in the middle and we see that it's just an empty object. This is just a, a JSON object and so here's just an empty object. There's nothing in our registration. Uh, and so we kind of go, oh, well, maybe that's the problem, right? Like that's probably like, maybe this doesn't fix it, but we're not gonna get very far without things here, right? Because we have to translate it. So we come in and we fill out the registration object with our first name, our last name, our password, our confirmation and our, our register string. And then we refresh the page and hey, they work. And so we have solved this problem by breaking it down that way. It still doesn't look exactly like the UX designed it because no UX that I know designs screens that look quite like that, but at least they're not showing the registration key anymore, right? But if you're smart, well, that's, that's condescending. If you're like me, sarcastic, not smart. If you're sarcastic sitting there, you're like, hey, my bugs aren't that simple, right? Like I don't need four steps to teach me how to fix a typo. Um, and you're right, you don't. Um, so sometimes the bugs and the problems are a little bit more complicated. So what do we do then? Well, we're going to go back and look at another physics problem. So this time we are talking about a plane with a takeoff speed of 88.3 meters per second, and it requires 1,365 meters to reach that speed. And the problem wants us to determine the acceleration of the plane and the required time to reach the speed. Another photorealistic picture here with our acceleration and our distance. Oh, I'm sorry, our velocity this time is 88.3 meters per second and our distance is 1,365 meters. So we know that we have uh, a velocity of 88.3 and 1,365. We know that from this uh, problem definition, but also from the picture that we labeled, which is another reason why having these pictures is sometimes helpful um, because you can get lost in the words. Uh, sometimes seeing it in a picture is a little bit easier. So we have our final velocity. That's the velocity right before the plane takes off. And we have our distance. How, how far does the plane have to travel to reach that velocity? Or how far can it travel? The runway is 1,365 meters. If you go 366, you're in the ditch and you're gonna get some bad feedback on Yelp or whatever site you use to rate airlines, I guess. Um, so now we need to figure out what's unknown. Well, we don't know acceleration or time. And now we have a problem um, because if you remember back to algebra, you can't have two, one equation with two unknowns because you can't solve that. You have to pin something, right? You have to have at least two equations for two unknowns in order to be able to solve it. Uh, but unfortunately we have both acceleration and time are unknown. So we have to pick a, we have to be um, uh, crafty in how we pick our starting equation. So we're gonna pick this one. Uh, it has a, a final velocity and an initial velocity. That's the VF and the VI. It has acceleration, which is A. We know all of that. Or no, I'm sorry, it has D for distance. We know all of that. We don't know A, but we know everything else. So we can solve that by saying the initial velocity, the plane's gonna start at rest. It's gonna get to 88.3 and it's gonna do it in in that time, or that's, I'm sorry, that distance, that's how much distance we have. So we can simplify and we get out that our acceleration is 2.8 meters per second squared. So we've now solved one of the things, right? We now have acceleration, 2.8 meters per second squared. So instead of a starting equation, we can now go to our next equation. And now we have a final velocity, which we still know, an initial velocity, which we still know, and an acceleration that we just found out, and we were only missing time. So we can plug those in, simplify, and we can get that it's gonna take 30.9 seconds or you have, you have to do this in 30.9 seconds or you run out of runway. So we now know that our answer is 2.8 meters per second squared in 30.9 seconds. That's how you uh, reach 88.3 meters per second in 1,365 meters. So you've solved yet another physics problem. You've done two today. So if nothing else happens in the conference today, you can go back on Monday to your boss and then when they ask like, what did you do learn at the conference? Like I solved two physics problems and they'll be totally confused. Like I thought I sent you to code Palooza. Um, so let's look at a more complicated bug, right? Because that's what we're really here for. So when I'm on the import screen for store three and I click the import button, the records that are coming back are for store 28. This might be an actual bug that you get. Someone might write this up. Um, it's very close to a bug that we had on an invoicing system that I worked on a couple of years ago. The store numbers are even the same. Um, so here's the picture. This time, because it's not just the UI, uh, we want a more, a bigger picture of like what's the system look like. So we, we have our UI and we see clearly here that it's store three and we see on our table that store 28 is coming back and we have some arrows showing that this is going to like a database or an API or something, right? So this is, this is the picture of our system. This is the, the system that is having the problem. 
Um, and, and we figure out what's known. Well, we know we're on import, uh, the import page for store 3, and we know that we're seeing records for store 28, so we can write those two down as our knowns. We're on store 3, seeing tw store 28. Um, but what's unknown? Well, again, it's software. There's an infinite number of things unknown, and even within our system, there's an infinite number of things unknown, or nearly infinite. Um, so we have to pick some. Well, it probably makes sense to see, like, we know there's this other thing, whether it's a database or an API or another system that this one's talking to. So we, don't, we need to know, like, what are we asking that thing, and what are we getting back from that thing? So we have, we have two options to start with. It probably makes sense to start with the what are we asking, because we're going to have to ask it anyway, even if we want to see the response. So this is how, this is kind of walking you through, talking you through how I would look at it, but this is kind of how I would approach it. I go, okay, well, if those are my two options, if those are the two most obvious things of unknown, then my starting location or my starting equation is going to be examine the request. So we pull up Chrome debug tools and we see here's the request. And we see that it went out to localhost 3000, transactions, it passed in store number three. Uh, we confirm that because down here in the query string parameters, we're passing in store number three. And so at this point, you're a little disappointed. You're hoping you're passing in store number 28 because then the problem's solved and it is as easy as the other one, right? But you're not. Uh, it doesn't pass in three. Or it does, it does pass in three. It's passing in what you're supposed to. Uh, but at the same time, you're probably a little excited because you're like, okay, great. The API is screwing up, right? Like, I've got it. It's going to be the response. So you go look at the response. Oh, let's, let's talk about our new known first. So we know store three, we know we're seeing store 28, and we also know that we're sending the right ID, which is important to note at this point, right? Much like we came back and said, okay, now we know acceleration so we can solve for time, we have a new piece of information that we now know. We're not assuming we're sending the right ID, we actually know it. So let's document that, let's keep track of it. So now we go to our response, and unfortunately it's sending back the right data as well. And so now you're totally deflated, and you're worried about stand-up tomorrow because you're going to still be on this bug, and people are going to be like, what do you mean it's sending the right data and requesting the right data, and you still don't know what's wrong, right? Um, and so you've kind of dashed, your hopes have been dashed because you thought of two things that it could be, and neither one of them were the right answer. Uh, so it's important, though, to go back and say, okay, well, we have yet another known, right? So not only is it on store 3, not only are we seeing store 28, but we're also requesting store 3, and we're returning store 3. So again, we've now filled up all of our unknowns, they're gone. We have no more unknowns that we identified. We only have a bunch of knowns, and we still have the problem. Which in itself is helpful to say, okay, everything that we thought we needed to figure out, we figured out and it's still a problem, so it has to be something else. So we'll go back and we'll update our picture. And especially if this is on a whiteboard, this is a great step to go update your picture, because then when your boss walks by, it looks like you're really busy updating your picture. <laughs> And really all you're doing is like, I don't know what I'm going to do next. I don't know what I'm going to do next, right? But let me sit here and draw this picture. Um, that's only true if you're drawing pictures like this. If you're drawing like Batman and stuff, they're probably going to go, we need to get that person some more work. Um, so we've updated our picture, and we go, yeah, we're sending three, we're getting three, and you'll probably sit there and stare at it for a while. What's going on? What could it be? Uh, and so you, you have to come up with a new unknown. So we know the request, we know the response. Well, the new unknown, how's the response getting used? Okay, so we know we're getting the right data. What are we doing with it once we get the data? So we, this is an Angular application. So we're going to go to our controller. And we're going to look at HTTP get. Yeah, that's right. That's the right URL. We're, we're even passing in the store number here. Hey, look, we get our data. Oh, we're returning a bunch of hard-coded data. Well, that doesn't seem right. And look, all of them have the store number 28. And so you probably then do like a get blame or look at who wrote this code in TFS. And then you're really disappointed because it was you. Uh, and so you're like, now I, I can't go read someone the Riot Act. I have to figure out what I was thinking. And then it dawns on you, like, oh yeah, we did the import screen long before the API was ready, so I just returned some data so I could make the HTML work and get the CSS all pretty. And I made that mental note to go back and fix it once the API was ready, and clearly I didn't do it, right? So maybe I don't hard code the data, maybe I just take the data that's returned from the API now that I have it and, and put that on the screen. That solves the problem, and maybe it'll close out the bug, and everyone's, everyone's happy. Um, so now we're going to do a little bit of, of class participation. Um, we're going we're gonna to work on a problem together, um, and, and we'll see um, how far we get. And, and I know the answer at the end, so if we, need to, if we need to skip steps or whatever, we can do that for time, although we have about 30 minutes, so we should be able to pull this off. Um, so we're going we're gonna to have Roman numeral math. I don't know why we have this. The business owner came and said, hey, we really need to be able to add Roman numerals together in our application. Um, seems like a bad idea, no matter how much you pushed back. They were like, no. We are disrupting the Roman numeral market. This is our thing. <laughs> but they, they, being business owners, uh, I, I guess, how many business owners do we have in the room? How many product owners? All right, okay, good. So being business owners, 
uh, they, they had some really awesome rules, like you can't use numbers. So you can't just say, well, V equals five, and then we'll just use add and, and solve the problem, right? So they're gonna put in some, some constraints for us. Um, so in all honesty, this is a, a coding kata. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of, uh, of Woody Zool. He does a lot of mob programming and no estimate stuff. He, we had him at Aperture um, a couple weeks back, uh, and he taught us some mob programming, and this is the kata that he used to teach us the mob programming. And, and he had even more rules, like we were trying to get creative, and he's like, no, you can't do that. Um, because he was trying to help us. The, the point wasn't to solve this problem, the point was to learn some of these mob programming things. Um, so let's look at the code. Okay, so here we have, let me pull this up. Some of you have already cheated, that's all right. Um, so we have this, uh, this library. Uh, we're gonna just have this add method here. We've got one variable that's probably appropriately named and one that's for some reason called C. Um, uh, but we're gonna convert our first number to i's. So um, Roman numeral, uh, i is one, ii is two, iii is three, iv is four, vi is six, x is 10, that kind of stuff. So we're gonna convert all of the numbers to, to i's for the first number, and then we're gonna do the same thing to the second number, and then we're gonna make a Roman numeral out of that. So we might have 40 i's as a string, and we wanna make that be um, XL, or we might have uh, six i's, and we wanna make that VI, that would be the output. Um, and so we have this failing test, um, because the, the product owner said, um, yeah, this isn't working. It was working for a while, but now it's not working. And so um, it's red and green, which might be hard to see, especially on that screen. But what the test says here is that you're, when you add XIV, so 14, uh, plus XXVII, so that would be 17, uh, then you should get 41 or XLI, right? But again, we can't use numbers, so we have to all immediately assume that we can, you can translate that to numbers on the fly. Um, and then our, our test comes back and it said, well, I expected uh, the value you got back was V, V, I, X, V, X, V, I, I, um, which there's a couple problems here. One, I don't think that's valid Roman numeral, like numerology or whatever the right word would be, um, because I think there's some rules there about what numbers can be next to each other. But two, that's not even 41. So we have a bigger problem. Uh, and we expected it to equal 41. And so then it shows the same thing down here. Uh, this is what you got. Uh, and this is what you told me I should get. So that's the stage, that's, that's the, the high level summary. So um, we're gonna go ahead and skip step one because there's not a, like a whiteboard to draw on and I'm not sure what we would draw for this one. Uh, we can use this as our picture. Uh, so step two, what do we know? And this is, this is the class participation part, what do we know? That x equals 10i is for example. Yeah, x equals 10i, great. That's a good one. There's nothing, nothing too obvious. Uh, I mean, don't, don't be afraid to be like, oh yeah, everyone knows that, that's fine. It, it sometimes helps to state the obvious. Okay, perfect. Uh, do, we know, do we know what language this is in? I think you said it. JavaScript. Yeah, it's JavaScript, so we've got our JS file up here. Um, some, on some projects, that's important to note, right? There's, there's teams that have um, multiple languages, .NET, JavaScript, there's teams that have, uh, there's companies that have rules that are like, oh, as long as you can make it work and support it, we don't care what language you write. So sometimes it's important to know what language you're even working in, because that's gonna dictate the rules. Um, what do we know about the tests? What's that? It failed. One, one test failed, yep. Do we know anything else about the tests? All the other ones passed, that's good to know, right? So probably what happened was everything was working until this one test case came in, right? So we know that, it, we know we're kind of on the right track, right? Um, yeah, that's all, that's all good stuff to know. Is there, is there any questions we need to ask about like how do these functions work or anything like that? Um, or do we want to get into that what's unknown at this point? Maybe that is the unknown. We don't know what they're doing, right? Because I'm hiding them from you. Um, so, so what's unknown? Well, we don't know how convert to I works or how make numeral works. Um, so what would our, if with that being the case, since we don't know what those are, what would our starting location be? Where's a good place to start looking? And there's not a right answer here, so don't be afraid. We can, okay, so let's see how that works. Like I said, there's no wrong answers, so you could have said, uh, you know, hey, let's go look at the other tests and see what they're doing. What if they all just say assert true equals true? Then the fact that there's 14 passing doesn't really help us, right? Um, so here we have convert to I's, and we're gonna get a numeral. And we're gonna say, okay, when it's X, replace it with VV. When it's IV, replace it with four I's. When it's V, replace it with five I's. 
So we know it's JavaScript. We know we're doing some replacement. Um, we, we know that x equals 10. We also know that v equals 5, so that kind of makes sense that x would be replaced with vv because that's, that's similar. Um, how many people write JavaScript semi-regularly? Now, now, now that we know that it's JavaScript, a few of you guys are like, I don't want to admit that I do, right? Because now he's going to call me. Okay, so the rest of you are excused then. No. Um, so we're using replace um, here. Let's look at what um, the other thing that's unknown. So we don't know, is this the problem or is this the problem? Um, but it's kind of the opposite of that, right? So we get all of our eyes and we start concatenating or we start uh, reducing them is the word I want to use there to get the Roman numeral. Um, what do we know? Like, how does replace work? Does anyone know? Anyone want to take a guess? What, I'm sorry, what did you say? Okay. So if we had a string, um, and this is where comments might bite me. Nope, okay. A lot of times my comments are like light gray. Um, so if we had XX, we would expect that it would be something like V, 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 right? Too many Vs, something like that. Is that what you're saying? It would replace it like that, okay. Um, so let's, uh, we know also, that's true, we also know that what it's spitting out is this, which is kind of strange. Um, we might spend some time here. So this is, this is really where um, my team on the mob programming exercise got stuck. This test case, so we'd gotten 14 of them to work, and Woody came over and he said, I want you to add these two numbers. And he looked at the code, and we looked at the code, and we go, well, that should be working. Right? And about the same time that he had the realization, somebody on our team had the realization, and we said, well, we're using JavaScript and we're using uh, replace, so let's go look at what replace actually does. So this might be part of your process, part of your steps. Like, what do I not know? Well, I don't know exactly how string replace works. What are the options I can pass in? So here we have some options that we can pass in. Um, this is the Mozilla developer network. Uh, and so this means you can either send in a regex or a substring for the first parameter and you can pass it either a new substring or a function for the second parameter. Um, and then it has some information down here below, like if you pass in a regex with a pattern or if you pass in a substring with a pattern. Um, and so I don't know that it's actually on this page. Um, it, it is? Where is it? Do you guys already see it? Okay. Only the first occurrence will be replaced, right? So for some reason, and I love JavaScript, I mean, that's one of the few things I haven't said sarcastically today. I actually do love JavaScript. Um, but for some reason, there's a difference when you pass in a string versus a regex. So we now know that. So what, it, what we, could, we could go convert these to regexes, right? And we'll just do that really quickly. We will do this with that. We'll replace everywhere. And then we'll replace um, that comma with that comma. That's the regex pattern. And then we'll save and we're still getting our failing test. So it appears that while string only does the first occurrence, that the way we have our regex right now isn't any more helpful. So who's our regex expert in the room? No one's going to admit to that one, right? Oh, same guy in the back. You're like a glutton for punishment. <laughs> what do we need to do on our regex for it to not be a stop after the first one? We can try that, like where, like here? Okay, so like star dot? No, that's not gonna do it with the comments. I'm not a regex expert either, so that's fine, but we'll just, um, we'll do that and let's just, that's not the, the solution, but if we did it, we would get the same thing, right? So um, I'm not gonna, you're not gonna watch me type that because that would be boring for you and painful for me to type in front of everybody. Um, so what, what are some other modifiers on regex? Does anyone know? Global flag. Global flag, yeah. So what if we replaced this with this? And we hit replace, and we hit save, and 15 tests are passing. So you've solved two physics problems and Roman numeral math. You are now ready to disrupt the Roman startup market, I suppose. But yeah, I mean, it, was not, it wasn't simple, right? And this was uh, the whole purpose of mob programming in the workshop that Woody did was that you get, um, it would be a group, this would be too big of a group, but maybe each table would be a team and it's to like brainstorm together and work together to solve this problem rather than me sitting here for a day and then coming to stand up tomorrow and going, still not solved. 
right? Somebody could go, oh, you're using a regex, right? And so that's exactly what we experienced. It was like, well, it should be working because we were telling it to replace this, right? And so we tried some things. We tried some different things like we did here. We tried different things than you guys did, but we still tried some things. And so, oh, well, let's try this. No, that's still failing the test. Let's try this. No, that's still failing the test. Until eventually, you know, we're like, all right, all else failed. Let's go to the documentation and start reading, right? Let's hit Stack Overflow up. Um, let's put a question out on Twitter. Uh, let's go to our Slack room, anything and everything to find the documentation. So we solved this problem now. We have, we, we figured out our unknown and it was the unknown was the, the pattern that we were using to match was incorrect. Um, and so now that we have this pattern, um, we actually can take this, we're not going to, but we can actually take this up to 3,999 with no real problem in Roman numeral math. Once you get to 4,000, there's a, like a Unicode or non-ASCII character that becomes hard to represent. Um, that's something I learned in mob programming. Um, so it becomes really hard, but you can you just keep following this pattern because now you have it. All right, so we got done uh, with that part in, in pretty good time, uh, and you didn't need me to give you the answer. You guys figured it out. So let's look at some additional tips. We've got our four rules. Um, well, what else can we know? So the, the four rules, and, and I, I phrase them that way deliberately. There's the four rules, like you should always think about these four things. These additional tips kind of take them at, uh, as they benefit you, right? So um, not necessarily rules. But the first one, write it out. Write as much out as you can. Um, I find myself, um, the more I write software, the less is on my desk, uh, like fewer toys and all this stuff. To the point now, like I have my laptop, or I have my, my, my computer, my monitor, and I have a, a scratch pad next to me. And I just, when I'm solving problems, I'm writing down as much data as, like every time I figure out a new known, I write that down. Every time I figure out a new unknown, I write that down. Um, plus, again, it comes back to your boss walking by and they see you taking notes. You look like the stellar employee. Um, versus if, if your boss walks by and you're like this, <laughs> right? Um, I work at a consulting company and we have every, everyone from people just out of college to, um, I don't know, some of us have been doing it close to 20 years. And, and some of the non-technical people, like the business de the development people and the accounting people, they see the developers walk by like this, and they come to me and they're like, is he working? And I'm like, oh yeah, he, he is. And they're like, well, it doesn't look like it. I'm like, trust me, it'll be okay, right? But, but that's a whole perception issue, right, as your boss walks by. So if you're writing down, you're taking notes, uh, so you're not just learning debugging, you're learning some free career advice as well. It makes it look like you're working, um, even if you're just like, get milk, uh, don't forget the hamburger. The other thing is verify your knowns and unknowns. Um, these are logic puzzles. Um, I'm going to assume most of you have done them, but I'm also going to assume that most of you haven't, so I'm going to explain to you how they work. So you try to, you try to figure out, like there's only one possible combination, like maybe Antoinette has the Abbott Hill brand shoe in size six, uh, and there's only one way to solve this, and they give you the clues on the right. Uh, and these are often done in elementary school and middle school for kids about this size to kind of get them to work through their deductive reasoning and stuff like that. Um, and then there's much harder ones for adults if this is your thing. Uh, and when you look at it, you see, okay, there's four clues. And so the natural instinct is like, okay, well, that's gonna be hard. I'm gonna have to make some assumptions because there's only four clues. There's one through four. And I can tell you right now, there's a lot more than four boxes. I don't know how many, but I'm pretty good at math and there's more than four, right? Um, and so what, what the thing here, what this teaches us though, is if we look at the first clue, it says Whitney's pair was one size larger than the Cormano footwear. And we think, okay, well, Whitney has, that, that tells us something about Whitney, right? But it's actually telling us a lot more. So it tells us that Whitney's pair was one size larger than the Cormano footwear. So first of all, Whitney can't have the Cormano, right? Because it's telling us that someone else has it. Hers is larger. Um, and second of all, it's telling us that the Cormano footwear can't be size seven because there's not a size that's larger than seven on the board. And third, it's telling us that Whitney can't have size four because there's not a size three for the Kermano for the size four to be one size higher. So with this one clue, we actually have three things, right? Um, and, and that often happens in the bug reports that we get in, right? Someone will say, this is the thing that happens, and you, they, what they told you is true, and it's required to know that, but it's often not sufficient, right? Uh, unless you guys are working with totally different um, bug reporting people than I've ever worked with. Like, the bug report is never sufficient, right? You always have to know more than what they put in. Um, so verify your knowns and your unknowns. Come back and, and, and I'm, I'm okay at these kind of things. And what I often do is I, I often make like the first pass and I fill out all the things. And then I come back through I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. And I fill that out. And then you, you make a multiple loops. And so especially if you're stuck on a problem, it's okay to revisit your knowns and unknowns. It's okay to come back and look at them and go, okay, well, if I know A and B, what else do I know? Oh, well, then I know C, right? And that's going to help you solve that problem. Next, ask questions to create a hypothesis. Um, so when we go back, let's go back to the storefront one where we were importing store three and store 28 and store 28 showed up. 
Um, that was a simplified, contrived example for the purpose of, of the talk, but what are some of the questions we could ask in that? So just a quick reminder, they're on store three, they're on the page for store three, they clicked import and store 28 showed up. What were questions that if I reported that bug to you, that would be good for you to ask me to get some more information so you could start forming a hypothesis? What happens if you go to another store's page? What happens if you go to another store's page? Great. What else? Anything else? Yeah. What happens if you don't have a connection in the back end? That's a good one. Yeah, especially knowing what we know now, right? Oh, it still shows 28. Like, that's weird. Um, yeah, what about, um, is it just showing 28? Or is it showing three and 28? Is it showing the store I'm on plus some other garbage data, right? So there's all these type of questions that we could ask and, and it's a little unfair to put you guys on the spot because this isn't a domain that you're working on day to day, but as you go back to your offices next week and you start having these kind of things, like you're in the midst of this domain and you'll start asking these type of questions. Now the flip side of that is that you have to be careful of too much data, right? You don't want to become a beautiful mind where you're drawing red lines between every piece of data thinking that this is gonna be the one missing piece that solves the, the bug, right? Because this can happen. Like we could go ask all of those questions and a hundred more that we just came up with. And what it would actually do is it actually slow us down in solving the problem, right? So the first gentleman said, Does it, uh, what happens if you go to another store? That's probably a sufficient question. We probably don't need to ask any more, right? Because when we go to store 17 and it shows 28, we now have a much better picture of what the problem is, right? Versus, well, okay, let's go to that one. Let's cut the connection. Let's go back to three and see if there's data. Let's ask all these questions. And now you have piles and piles of paper and you're like, so many unknowns and so many knowns and you're like, I don't, I don't know what to do, right? Especially because with the physics problems, they had like the right answer that they knew the answer before they wrote the problem and so they gave you the right information so you could get to that solution. We're in software and the person writing the bug might not know the right answer and even if they do, they probably don't know the system enough, especially if it's a user. They were just like, hey, this is what happened when I tried to, when I tried to buy tickets on your site. Like, I don't know what you did, right? Um, and so you, you're not gonna have all of that information. It's not gonna be a nice little packaged thing. Um, so be aware of, of too much data as well. Um, so I'm kind of, kind of uh, contradicting myself a little bit there. But this is one of those things that as you follow these kind of uh, problem solving skills and, and rules uh, more, you're gonna get more experience with this and you're gonna be more comfortable knowing like what are the right questions to ask. Uh, and maybe you'll have a question, you're like, okay, I'm gonna hold on to that one. I'm gonna go explore all this other data first and if that still doesn't work, then I'll come ask that one. And that might, that's how often I'll make sure I don't have too much data. So let's break it down to the, the TLDR, the, the too long, didn't listen, uh, tuned out in the back, uh, Twitter's more interesting, all that, which happens in conferences. Um, and there's no way that all of you paid attention the entire time. I'm a conference attender myself, I get that. So let's sum up. Um, this is a common uh, programming meme, it makes me laugh. And at the same time, I actually hate it. Uh, and here's why. Uh, and, and so I, I start off by saying I laugh, so if you laugh, you don't feel bad. But here's the reason I hate it. Um, because, because we're paid to know why, right? We're, we're paid to write software that works for people. Um, and, unless this is just your hobby, in which case maybe you can tune out this part. But as professional software developers, we're paid to solve problems and we're paid to know why. And so earlier I talked about, um, uh, I had a bug for a few days where the pop-up menu wasn't showing the text. And that was legit, that was like last week or two weeks ago. And, and it was one of those things that um, the QA person hit me up and they said, um, hey Nate, this isn't working. And can you take a look at it? And I said, it was right before Memorial Day. And I was like, yeah, can I look at it Tuesday? And they're like, yeah, no problem. So I come back Tuesday, mid afternoon, I finally get around to the bug and I'm like, hey, it works. And so I messaged the QA person, I'm like, hey, it looks like it works. Somebody else's commit must have fixed it. And I'm like, sweet, get across that one off, right? I don't know why it works, um, but it does now. And he comes back, he's like, no, no it doesn't. And I'm like, really? Because here's my screenshot. Like I have proof, here it is on my, on my computer, right? And he said, oh yeah, use, uh, use the develop uh, server instead of running it locally. And so I did that and I was like, oh yeah, it doesn't work. And that's weird because this is just JavaScript hitting the same API, whether it's develop or local. So what's going on? Like the same code should be up. Uh, and I had to trace it all the way down. And what ultimately happened was we're writing an Angular application and we're trying to abstract Angular out as much as possible so that we're not dependent upon it. And what that means is we're using the Angular translation service, um, but this particular bug was trying to use the translation service at about the same time that Angular was getting instantiated. So it was a race condition. And there's not a lot of race conditions in front end web anymore. In fact, it's probably been 10 years since I've actually dealt with a real race condition, even on the server side. So that was interesting to me. But what, what it meant was, once I figured all that out, I could move the code post Angular initialization, 
and now it always works. I can show you the tests that show it always works. I can show you, I can walk you through the code and show you that it always works. We can put it up on the server and show you that it always works, right? I now know that it works and I now know why it works. If I just happen to work, then today while I'm at a conference, they could be fighting the same issue, right? And so that, if, if that's the case, then we've failed as software professionals because we've, we've fixed a bug that is also broken for some unknown reason in the future, right? So in my opinion, in my estimation, there's one time that this, this kind of thought should happen. And that is, you, you get the bug, you get it working, and you go, I don't know why it's working. And it's okay to say that. As long as the next thought is, I'm gonna go figure out why, right? Because that's what we're, I mean, that's what we're getting paid for. We can, we can you know, get our, uh, my, my, my kids are 13 and 15, we can hire them to, to do magic bugs if that's all it's gonna take, right? Um, but as professionals, we need to be able to actually solve this and explain why it should happen or why it is happening. So as much as I, and I do, I, this makes me laugh every time I see it, it's okay to laugh at it. But I, at the same time, in the back of my head, I'm like, yeah, but that just doesn't sit well with me as well um, because I, I, we should know why something doesn't work. So when in doubt, follow these steps. We're gonna have a labeled diagram. We're gonna have what's known. We're gonna have what's unknown. We're gonna have a starting equation or in software world, uh, a starting location. You know, is it the response? Is it the API? Is it the front end? Is it CSS, which is like 99% of my bugs right now um, because that's how good of CSS I am. Um, and I always make things somehow float off the screen. Um, the steps are, are gonna help you move these things from the anxiety of this is an impossible bug to something that's achievable, right? And even if you don't solve the problem, that's okay because you get those little victories. Like, well, at least I know what's known, right? And so if I go talk to someone else on the team, I can say, here's what I know, here's what I don't know, and now I can use their brain power, right? I've done some, some baby work or baby steps for them. I've done some found work for, foundation work for them where I'm telling them, here's what you need to know about the bug. So all that is to say, um, these are ways that you can take elementary physics, you can apply it to your life as a software developer without ever needing to really know physics. You didn't have to go to that anxiety inducing class and, and worry about not getting a C, which I did by the way, I, I continued on um, and got my degree. Um, so you, we can apply those kinds of things from other disciplines, from other fields, from other parts of our life to software. And we can look at how we solve problems is really universal. So how a physicist solves problems at the core is the same as how we solve them as software developers. Uh, my contact information's up there if you wanna reach out to me. Uh, I'll be around the rest of the day today and, and most of the day tomorrow before I fly out again, but I just wanna say thank you guys and uh, I hope it was worth it for you guys.